Okay, welcome everyone to our uh, astroparticle seminar of this week. We are uh, very happy to have uh, Lara Nava as our speaker from the National Institute for Astrophysics and uh, the Observatory of Vera in Italy. Uh, Lara did her PhD at the University of Insubria in Italy. Then she was a postdoc at CISA in Trieste, uh, then at uh, APC at Paris, at, in Paris. Uh, then a, she was also a postdoc at Marie Curie Fellow at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and then a postdoc at the INFN in Trieste. Uh, she was then a postdoc at Marie Curie Fellow again at the National Institute of Astrophysics in, in the Observatory of Brera in Italy, and now she's a permanent researcher also there. Uh, Lara is an expert in, in many aspects of gamma ray burst, uh, both in theory and in observations. Uh, some of the things she's worked on are uh, the shape and origin of the prompt gamma ray burst emission, the high energy emission from the GRBs, the afterglow emission, uh, figuring out the bull Lorentz factors of GRB emission, jet morphology, etc. She's also worked on um, cosmic rays, uh, like in the emission from supernova remnants, uh, their connection to galactic gamma rays, and nonlinear propagation of cosmic rays and in neutron star mergers, including uh, things like uh, the R process uh, production of uh, elements. And uh, finally, she's also a member of, of a few collaborations like MAGIC, CTE, and e Astrogram. And uh, today we're happy to have her talk about high and very high energy emission from gamma ray bursts. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, questions are welcome during the talk. Uh, you can either raise your hand or write them in a uh, chat box and I'll read them over to Lara. All right, Lara, it's Oh, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. And so let's start. I will first give a, um, a general overview of the gamma reverse phenomenon. So I'm assuming that most of you are not familiar at all with gamma reverse. And then I will pause for uh, questions on this first part of the talk. And then in the second part, I will uh, focus on uh, high energy emission from gamma ray bursts, and in particular on the recent discovery that gamma ray bursts are TV emitters. Um, so let's start. Uh, so gamma ray bursts are cosmological sources. So here you can see the distribution in the sky that is isotropic. So this was the first clue that the gamma ray bursts are extragalactic sources. And uh, since 1997, when the optical counterpart was discovered, we can measure the, the redshift for most of gamma ray bursts from the afterglow optical uh, emission or from the identification of the uh, host uh, galaxy. So this is the redshift distribution of gamma ray burst. Uh, colors just refer to gamma ray bursts that before SWIFT or uh, after SWIFT in the SWIFT era, so since 2004. So the mean red shift is around two, but as you can see, several gamma reverse have been detected also at quite high red shifts, so above four. And we also have few gamma reverse detected uh, at red shift larger than six. And the record holder is currently this gamma reverse here or nine or four, 29B detected at red shift 9.3. So the emission in gamma ray burst um, has two well separated phases, the prompt and the afterglow. So the prompt emission here in red is detected in the soft gamma ray band hard X-ray. So we are talking about KV, MEV energy range. The duration of this emission ranges from fraction of seconds to in the most extreme cases, thousand of seconds. And the flux is highly variable, and spectra of the prompt emission are non-thermal. Then immediately after the prompt, or sometimes it's even detected simultaneously to the prompt, we start detecting what is called the afterglow radiation that is detected at longer wavelengths, so from soft X-ray, optical, and sometimes we also have radio detections. Um, the flux decays in time as a power law. Um, this emission is visible for several days, weeks, or even months in the brightest cases. 
uh, after the end of the prompt radiation. And also in this case, the, the spectra are uh, non-thermal. So this is a general um, a description of the standard model that we use to explain prompt and after radiation from gamma reversed. So uh, this is not an instantaneous picture of the gamma reverse. It's more an evolution in time. So gamma reverse are transient sources. So we start from a central engine that is most likely a stellar mass black hole uh, surrounded by an accretion disk. So as the matter is uh, accreted by the black hole, an outflow is launched. So we have an outflow of ultra relativistic matter and radiation and magnetic field that travels uh, with large factor probably of several hundred. And uh, this outflow is collimated probably in two opposite jets. So it's not isotropic. And uh, when this jet becomes um, optically thin, we expect to see uh, radiation coming out from the jet in the form of a thermal component. What we see is non-thermal. So probably this uh, radiation is, sub is a subdominant. So most of the energy is either in the bulk motion of the particles or in the magnetic field. And here there is the first open question of gamma reverse. What is the composition of the jet? What is carrying the energy? Is the magnetic field or are the particles with their bulk motion? Second question is the energy carried by the jet. So what we see from gamma reverse is electromagnetic radiation. So it's the part of the energy of the jet that has been converted to radiation. And we don't know this efficiency for conversion to um, electromagnetic energy. And then uh, the other uh, uncertainty is on the jet opinion angle. So usually we estimate from the luminosity that we receive from the gamma reverse, we estimate the isotropic equivalent energy of the emission, which means assuming that this emission is isotropic, but most likely is uh, collimated into two jets. And only if we can measure the the jet opening angle, we can derive the true energy of the emission and uh, have a lower limit, at least, on the energy carried by the jet. Uh, also, the Lorentz factor is difficult to measure. So um, we know by several arguments or um, estimates, when it's possible, that it must be of the order of 100. But the, the distribution, the Lorentz factor the distribution of gamma reversal is quite unknown. Okay, then um, we see prompt emission, which means that the jet at some point must dissipate the energy and accelerate particles. And then these particles will radiate a non-thermal spectrum, probably synchrotron radiation. So um, the dissipation mechanism, uh, the nature of the dissipation mechanism is uh, uncertain because it depends on the nature of the jet. If the jet is uh, matter dominated, we expect dissipation that can take place through internal shocks. So imagine that the outflow is not homogeneous, but is composed by different well-separated shells is an approximation, of course. And if the shells have a slightly different velocities, they will collide and produce these internal shocks that can accelerate particles, amplify the magnetic field, and we expect to see synchrotron radiation. Um, in the other scenario, if most of the energy is in the magnetic field, then we can dissipate part of the energy through uh, magnetic reconnection events. Uh, in any case, we expect to have um, energetic electrons uh, emitting synchrotron radiation. So we have several open questions also for the prompt emission. So the prompt emission is probably the least understood part of the gamma reverse physics. We don't know the nature of the dissipation mechanism. 
the synchrotron emission is not consistent with the spectra that we see. And uh, uh, we don't even know exactly where the dissipation takes place. So what is the distance between the emitting region and the central engine? So for internal shocks, it's estimated to be around 10 to the 13, 14 centimeters, while for the magnetic jet, it can be a bit larger. Um, this is the typical spectrum from the prompt emission of gamma ray bursts. So um, it's described by power laws at low and high energies. And uh, there is a peak where most of the energy is radiated. And if you compare this um, photon index with what you expect from synchrotron theory, there is an inconsistency. So uh, we really don't know yet what is the mechanism, the radiative mechanism producing prompt emission in gamma ray burst. These are different examples of prompt light curves. So as you can see, there is no typical light curve. You can have different morphologies, one single peak or more well separated peaks or very complex behavior. Now, if you take a large sample of gamma ray bursts and start measuring the duration of the prompt emission, which is called T90, so T90 is a parameter that is used to estimate the duration of the prompt emission, you'll see that the distribution is bimodal. So this was the first hint for the existence of two different classes of gamma ray bursts, short, if the prompt emission lasts less than two seconds, or long gamma ray bursts if the prompt emission lasts longer than two seconds. The difference is probably due to a different progenitor. So the uh, final system, central engine, that is an accreting black hole, uh, can be produced through different channels. So for long gamma ray bursts, uh, we believe that the progenitor is a massive star and the core collapse of the mass star produces the black hole plus accretion disk. Uh, for short gamma ray bursts, instead, we need to invoke the merger of two um, neutron star or a neutron star and the black hole. Um, since uh, 19, um, 2017, we know that uh, neutron star, neutron star merger can indeed produce short gamma ray bursts because a short gamma ray burst was detected in association with a gravitational wave signal from the merger of two neutron stars. And we still need confirmation for the possibility to produce gamma ray burst, short gamma ray bursts in connection with the merger of neutron star and a black hole system. Okay, so after the prompt, we detect the afterglow radiation. So now you can imagine that the fireball uh, is, behaves like a homogeneous shell. So all the dishomogeneities um, internal to the jet have been uh, uh, deleted. So in first approximation, we can imagine a single shell that is uh, expanding into the external medium at, at some point the external medium will start to affect the dynamic of the jet. So the jet start to decelerate, a shock wave um, travels into the external medium, the so-called forward shock or external shock, and the particles of the external medium are accelerated, uh, the magnetic field is amplified, and again, we expect to see synchrotron radiation from the accelerated electrons. And this is the interpretation for what we see in X-ray, optical, and um, radio, um, radio band. So usually the radiation emitted in the afterglow is smaller, much smaller than what we see in the prompt. Uh, this means, this implies that the prompt was very efficient and only a small fraction of the energy is left for the afterglow radiation. This argument, uh, led to um, prefer magnetic reconnection over internal shocks because internal shocks are a very inefficient way uh, to dissipate the energy of the jet. And then in case of internal shocks, we would see a lot of energy available for the afterglow. So this was one of the main arguments or maybe the main argument to 
um, start focusing on magnetic jets and magnetic reconnection uh, and abandoning the general uh, standard model that instead invokes matter-dominated jets and internal shocks as dissipation mechanism. These are examples of circular light curves in X-ray here and optical in the other panel. So you see many different gamma ray bursts. Um, this part is still prompt radiation, so detected by BAT. So these are swift observations. And the afterglow starts around here. So you can see that the flux decays in time as a power law. Um, actually, these are all nice cases where the theory and the observation agree quite well, but very often we see features in the X-ray that we cannot explain with a single model, uh, with a simple model like flares or plateaus extending up to 10 to 4 seconds or a brightening that um, cannot be explained with a simple model and we need to invoke more emission components. And here you see several examples of optical light curves. These in general behave as expected as single power laws, um, but also in optical, sometimes we have features that uh, are still not well uh, explained. So the afterglow, uh, it's in any case better understood than the prompt emission. And in principle, we would like to use after observation to learn about the physics of gamma ray bursts and of the environment. Because as you can imagine, uh, the final uh, radiative output that we detect in, our, in afterglow and the afterglow phase is due to the interaction between the jet and the external medium. So it means that the radiation that we see is affected by the properties of the jet and in particular energy and the Lorentz factor and is affected by the properties of the circumbus medium, so the density and the density profile. Uh, the radial profile of the external medium gives a lot of information about the progenitor. So in short gamma reverse, we expect homogeneous medium with very low density. Uh, for long gamma reverse, we expect a medium shaped by the wind of the stellar progenitor. So, we expect to learn also about the last phases of the stellar evolution. And then the afterglow radiation uh, will also depend on the physics of the relativistic shocks. So in particular, will depend on the fraction of dissipated energy that is used to accelerate the uh, electrons. Uh, will depend on the spectrum of the accelerated electrons and also on the fraction of dissipated energy that is used to amplify the magnetic field. So as you can see, the afterglow radiation, its shape and uh, luminosity depends on seven parameters. So very often it's difficult to use afterglow observation to constrain all these parameters. Also because um, in general, in uh, average gamma ray bursts, we don't have we well sampled light curves at all wavelengths. So unfortunately, um, the potential of afterglow radiation to learn about all these physics from the external medium to progenitors, the jet, the, the relativistic shocks is very limited by the fact that there are uh, strong degeneracies among all the uh, free parameters. Okay, so after this general a brief introduction on gamma ray bursts that will be necessary to understand the, the, the second part. I would like to stop and see if you have questions. So, so I have one actually, okay, may I? Sure. Uh, so, um, so thank you. So in, in the slide where you're showing the typical spectrum of the prompt emission, so this is like an integrating an integrated spectrum, I guess here. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, and so yeah, I was wondering like, uh, so you, you were saying that the slope, um, the typical slope you would expect from synchrotron emission is not the one that you see on the data, and like, what is actually your expectation and why it is 
inconsistent with the data. This was my question. Yeah, sure. So the main inconsistency is that uh, very often we see spectra that are harder than the synchrotron spectrum. Uh, so, but, but the, so the synchrotron spectrum depends also on the um, the, inje uh, the uh, I mean injection spectrum of electron, I guess. This high energy part, yes. This depends on the spectrum, but ah. this is dominated by cooling. Ah, this is only defined by cooling because this is a delta injection in time, or so this this is not a steady state uh, uh, equation that you solve. I guess it's a. Yes, exactly. You have con injection, continuous injection for a limited time. And uh, so you can follow, this is fast cooling. So particles in any case uh, cool very rapidly. And what you see here is the cooled part of the uh, emission. Okay, so, okay, very good. I, so I understand then. So, okay, and that this, this is a part that is not consistent with expectation. Yes, yes, or because you have a clear, um, prediction for the synchrotron. So you have a one third in, below yeah. the cooling frequency, and then you expect uh, something like minus 1.5 in, mm -hmm. in photon index, so minus 0.5. And um, you see actually something that is in between these two values as average typical value of this photon index. But in many cases, you see something that is harder than one third. So it's really hard to, to explain with synchrotron model. Okay, thank you very much. I think okay. Tom has a question, I think. Yeah, uh, just, just one, that's okay. I was just wondering, um, is it known or are there theories about what makes the burst happen in the first place? So you have this object that's accreting for, I guess, presumably a very long period of time. What makes it suddenly burst of this big release? In the first oh, no, no, the accretion is very short because you have, a... so these are explosive phenomena. So when the um, uh, compact object forms, it's surrounded by this small accretion disk. And as soon as it accretes the matter, it launches a jet and that's it. And then uh, the jet is not a steady outflow. So it's something, the, the outflow, the emission of this matter lasts for seconds. And then we see an emission that has a similar time scales. Oh, I see, okay, so it yeah. just grabs a small amount, more large amount of matter, yeah, yeah. basically. And not. then the accretion stops. Once you accreted this matter that remained after the collapse or the merger, uh, everything stops. So you just have this um, jet, this outflow that is traveling in the external medium and first produces by internal dissipation the front emission and then uh, the afterglow radiation. I see, thank you. So the matter is, is basically the remnants of, the, of what was left when we formed the black hole in the first place. Yeah. I see, thank you. I see no other questions, so please, Laura, go ahead. Okay, so in the second part, uh, I will focus on GV and TV emission from gamma ray burst. These two energy ranges are studied with different instruments. So let's start with the GV radiation. We uh, already knew with EGRET that gamma ray burst emit also GV radiation. So EGRET was on board the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory and uh, um, the low energy instruments, so KV, MEV instrument, but it detected almost 3000 gamma ray bursts and EGRET at higher energies uh, detected only six of them. And um, so we are in this energy range, 20 MeV to 30 GeV. And uh, uh, even though the numbers are very small, it was already clear with EGRET that we, um, are looking at different uh, components. So GV emission can be sometimes just the tail of the prompt emission. Um, so here again, there is the prompt spectrum. So sometimes what was detected at 100 GV or 200 MeV was just, it was consistent with being just the tail of what we see in the prompt. 
but sometimes EGRET clearly detected GED radiation at much later time. So when the prompt is already uh, ended and uh, during the afterglow emission. So probably um, already EGRET uh, make clear that there is GV emission or 100 MeV emission produced during the prompt. And there is also GV emission producing during the afterglow. Very famous, this case here. So uh, what we see in black is the prompt emission. So there is a spike here. Uh, within uh, 100 seconds then just background radiation and egret in red detected photons both during the prompt but also a uh, 18 gv photon 75 minutes after the prompt so clearly related with the afterglow uh, component now we detect uh, gamma ray bursts at gv energies then thanks to fermi lat so um, these numbers are taken from the second LAT catalog of gamma ray bursts that stops at 2018. So 10 years of LAT observations of gamma ray bursts. And in total, um, LAT detected 169 gamma ray bursts, both long and short. Uh, this is a small fraction of the gamma ray bursts detected in their prompt emission by the Fermi GBM. So GBM is sensitive in the KV, MEV range, so detect prompt emission from many gamma ray bursts, four, five every week. And uh, only a small fraction of them is also detected at higher energies. And usually this emission is detected below one GV or around one GV, but in 16 cases, there are photons detected um, above 10 GV. And the record holder is this photon detected at 95 GV from, from a very bright uh, gamma ray burst. LAT also um, discovered that this emission can um, last uh, um, up to 10 to 4 seconds, and so a very long component. These are um, 10 examples of light curves um, of emission detected by LATS in the um, 0.1 to 10 GV range. So as you can see, the flux decays in time as a power law. And uh, these are all gamma bursts we know redshift. Um, we used them in 2014 to study the origin of this emission and see if this is consistent with synchrotron radiation in the afterglow. So it's the high energy part of the afterglow spectrum. The similarity with the optical light curve is, uh, is obvious. So you can see from this comparison that um, the behavior of these light curves at the energy is similar to what we see in the afterglow, for example, in the optical. Uh, so there is no variability, it's a power of decay, it's very smooth and long lasting. So if these observations of GV radiation uh, in those cases where the emission lasts much longer than the prompt, so it's clearly associated to the external shock, to the after radiation, um, uh, can, uh, how can we use them? If this is an interpretation, how can we use them to learn about the physics of external shocks. Well, there is something nice in observing the synchrotron spectrum as such a large energy, because if this is the synchrotron spectrum, so here you have the cooling frequency, the afterglow is, um, for most of the time, except the very beginning, is in slow cooling. So here you have the cooling frequency. This is the synchrotron frequency corresponding to electrons with the minimum energy. And uh, so you have two breaks in the uh, spectrum. And this radiation here above the cooling frequency is produced by electrons that are in fast cooling. So they are emitting all the energy they have, no matter the magnetic field, no matter the density. So the flux here is quite independent from all the seven uh, free parameters that we saw um, that we need to describe the afterglow. 
Here, the luminosity just depends on the energy of the electrons because they will radiate all their energy. So this has been used uh, with X-ray observation in order to infer a robust estimate of the energy of the jet. And this is quite important because if we know the energy of the jet during the afterglow mission, and we know the amount of energy emitted during the prompt radiation, we can estimate the efficiency of the prompt radiation. If the mechanism producing the prompt, it, the prompt is very efficient, we expect to see a small amount of energy during the afterglow. Otherwise, if we see a lot of energy during the afterglow, uh, we can say that um, the uh, emission mechanism producing the prompt was very inefficient. inefficient. And then we can start uh, deciding which model for the prompt emission and for the dissipation and for the jet composition is, uh, is the, um, the better one. Okay, so now that we have also GV observations, we can do the same exercise. Of course, if X-rays are above the cooling frequency, even more, uh, this is even more true for the GV uh, energy range. So in this case, we took 10 gamma ray bursts with LAT and XRT observations and estimate the energy of the jet starting from X-ray and LAT observation independently. Of course, we need to um, infer the same estimate of the jet energy, but this is not the case. So the ratio between the energetic estimated using X-rays and using uh, GV radiation, uh, it's far from being one. So it means that the two different observations gives quite different results on the inferred energy of the jet. So it's, it seems like the X-ray is less uh, luminous than what predicted by the model or the LAT is more luminous than what it should be. So by modeling this gamma ray burst, so performing a full modeling uh, also with uh, optical observations, we saw that the problem uh, can be solved in two different ways. So it also depends from, from the gamma ray burst. Sometimes simply the X-ray is below the cooling frequency. So the X-ray is not a good proxy for the energy of the jet because it's emitted by electrons that are in slow cooling. Instead, in GV range is above the cooling frequency. So the GV emission is a good proxy for the energy of the blast wave. Um, another possibility is that the flux in the X-ray range is suppressed by uh, inverse Compton cooling. So this part of the synchrotron spectrum is efficiently upscattered to another component at higher energies, an inverse Compton component, and uh, the X-ray flux is uh, then reduced. And this is not true for GV energies because at this point, klein schina um, plays an important role. So this scattering occurs in klein schina regimes, so the uh, cross-section is very reduced and they are not efficiently upscattered to high energy. In both cases, we see that the GEV emission is a more robust proxy for the energy of the jet and then is a more robust proxy for deriving the efficiency of the prompt emission. And if we use this new, uh, relatively new GV observation from Fermi, uh, we can infer um, that the mechanism producing e uh, prompt emission can be uh, an inefficient mechanism. So internal shocks are still a viable model to produce, uh, uh, to dissipate the jet energy and uh, um, produce um, SS, um, synchrotron radiation from the prompt emission. Another result of this modeling using also GV radiation is that we could put upper limits on epsilon B, which is the fraction of energy, dissipated energy by the external shock, 
that is used to amplify the magnetic field. Uh, we don't know much about acceleration and magnetic field um, amplification at the external shocks that are ultra relativistic shocks. And usually uh, people assume that this fraction that goes into the magnetic field is 10% or 1%. And uh, here we demonstrated that actually uh, that the value of epsilon B must be much smaller to explain GEV observations together with X-ray and optical. So this multi-wavelength modeling requires very small values of epsilon B. This also suggests that there should be a very high energy component, a synchrotron self compton component at higher energies uh, because we are lowering the energy density of the magnetic field. Okay, so another uh, hint for the presence of a very high energy component already present in Fermi data is this one. So it's, this is a plot. I made this exercise in this review about high energy emission from 2018. So from each gamma ray burst detected by LAT, I took one photon, just a photon with the highest energy. So each point in this plot is a photon from a single GRB. And, uh, the, it's the one with the highest energy and uh, I plot the energy versus the arrival time. So uh, there is a limit to the maximum energy of synchrotron photons because electrons will be accelerated in the shock to a maximum Lorentz factor, and this reflects into a maximum energy of the synchrotron photons. Uh, this maximum energy is in the commuting frame, so in the frame of the fluid is about 100 MeV. It doesn't depend on the magnetic field or any other quantities. It's a fixed uh, value if we assume maximum, maximal efficiency in the acceleration, so at, at the bomb rate. So under this assumption, you can derive the very highest possible energy for the synchrotron photons. And then since gamma ray bursts are relativistic, we need to multiply this 100 MeV uh, by gamma, the bulk Lorentz factor to account for beaming effect. Okay, but the bulk Lorentz factor during the afterglow phase is decreasing because the fireball is decelerating. So also the this maximum photon energy of synchrotron radiation is decreasing with time. So here I use different assumption, homogeneous medium, wind-like medium, uh, by playing a bit with the parameters, trying to obtain the highest possible uh, maximum value of the synchrotron photons. And still, as you can see, there are many photons above these limiting curves. So it's clear that photons above 10 GV detected after 1000 seconds are almost impossible to explain with synchrotron emission unless we completely decide that we didn't understand anything about the acceleration process. So there is in the last data a hint for an inverse Compton component, so probably what is going on is that LAT is detecting the high energy part of the synchrotron spectrum, but in the highest part of the sensitivity range of LAT, we see already some photons from a component that is dominating the emission at higher energies. So until a few years ago, the situation was this one. There was the idea that a self-compton component was there, but there was no direct evidence. Um, TV observations until 2019 resulted only in upper limits, so there were no detection. Uh, all these ground-based uh, sharing of telescopes keep observing gamma ray bursts, so they observed in the last 15 years 100 of gamma ray bursts with no results. Um, then at the beginning of 2019, MAGIC finally announced the detection at TV energies of the first gamma ray burst. So 
Um, this birth is called 1901-14C, so detected in January in 2019. Redshift is 0 0.42. That is quite interesting because at this redshift, the absorption of TV radiation from the extragalactic background light is already important. So to detect a gamma ray burst at one TV uh, from redshift 0 0.42, it means that the, uh, intrinsically the emission at TV energy is was very bright. This is a longer gamma ray burst. You can see here the prompt light curve. So this is the, these are the light curves at all different wavelengths. Here in gray, uh, you can see the prompt emission. Uh, prompt emission lasts about uh, 25 seconds, and then we start to see the afterglow radiation. And this is the magic light curve. So this is the first light curve of a gamma ray burst at TV energies. In particular, this is integrated from 0.3 to 1 uh, TV. As you can see, it's very similar to the X-ray light curve. So it gets in time as a power law. Uh, the energy output in the magic energy range is very similar to the one in the X-ray range. And to the one in the GV range, these red points are the emission detected by LAT. LAT could not observe from here to almost 10 to the four seconds due to observing constraints. And then when the gamma ray burst entered again, the field of view of LAT, uh, LAT detected again a GV emission from this gamma ray burst. Okay, so MAGIC started observation one minute after the prompt emission, so it was very, very quick in pointing the gamma ray burst and uh, observed a significant emission up to 40 minutes after the gamma ray burst. These are the spectra by MAGIC in different energy ranges, uh, sorry, in different time intervals. The photon index, uh, probably um, evolves with time, becomes softer at later times, but it's always consistent within the errors with minus 2.2. And uh, for the first two uh, time intervals, we can compare the SED, so we can add in this plot also BAT, GBM, and XRT data. So this is the comparison between uh, X-rays and the very high energy range. And uh, as you can see, the amount of energy is more or less the same in two different energy ranges. And here, lot observations were uh, fundamental to um, show that there is actually, uh, we are looking at two different spectral components because if you add lot data, you can see that uh, clearly, there is a double bump in the SED of gamma ray bursts. So this is the first evidence for a double bump in the SED uh, of a gamma ray burst. So um, in the magic paper, we uh, propose modeling of these observations as synchrotron plus synchrotron self-compton uh, component. Um, of course, uh, we need to model not only the spectra at some particular time, but we need with the same model and same parameters to explain also all the temporal evolution. So model the light curve at different frequencies. So you see here the light curves by MAGIC, XRT and LAT, and with a solid line, the, the modeling that is already the sum of the synchrotron plus SSC component. MAGIC, of course, is always dominated by the SSC. LAT is dominated by the synchrotron emission. And of course, also XRT is always dominated by synchrotron. Uh, these are the parameters that we infer. So there are, there are the values of the parameters that we infer from the modeling. So the energy is quite large. It's larger than what emitted during the prompt, a factor of two or three. The Lorentz factor in the initial Lorentz factor of the fireball, it's around 700. And here you can see the other 
uh, parameter epsilon b as already inferred from GV data alone is quite small, that, so 10 to the minus 4, while the fraction of dissipate, shock dissipated energy that goes into the electrons is 7%, so consistent with the usual assumption of 10%. If we go a later times, there is something very interesting. So first of all, you see that this LAT detection at 10 to the four seconds is now dominated by the synchrotron self quantum contribution. So here I'm uh, plotting explicitly um, the uh, flux of the SSC component. And as you can see, this last point is inverse Compton emission. So it means that synchrotron and inverse Compton are shifting to lower frequencies. And now the SSC enters the LAT energy range. Um, okay, there are a few problems. I'm not sure I can comment deeply in all of them, but as you can see, optical data are not modeled by this uh, um, very same um, model that is able to explain uh, early time emission. So this might point to an evolution in time of some uh, parameters. Uh, we always assume in gamma ray burst afterward modeling that the efficiency for accelerating the particle, for amplifying the magnetic field um, are always constant in time, even though the fireball is accelerating and becoming at some point even non-relativistic. So, uh, this might be an indication for the fact that um, the picture is more complicated and we need to start invoking some uh, evolution in time of the parameters. Uh, the dotted line show a different modeling that is optimizes the modeling at late times, but it's inconsistent with early time magic uh, observations. So uh, this might be an indication that uh, some parameters may evolve, uh, in particular the efficiency for shock acceleration and magnetic field um, amplification may evolve with time. Okay, then there was another announcement for a detection of TV radiation uh, from a gamma ray burst. So this gamma ray burst was from 2018 but as um, announced the detection only after the um, detection by MAGIC. Um, so in this case, uh, we have only one point. So there is no light curve, but there is one detection at around 10, 11 hours after uh, the prompt. So at much longer time as compared to the MAGIC detection. This gamma ray burst is at even higher redshift, so 0.65, it's still a long gamma ray burst. And what is very interesting here is that also in this case, the TV flux, actually this point is integrated between 100 GV and 440 GV. So um, this, uh, in this energy range, the luminosity that we see is again similar to the luminosity emitted in the X-ray energy range. This means that synchrotron and inverse Compton component share a similar amount of energy. Then there are two additional detections at very high energies, um, one by S and one by MAGIC. Um, however, there is no public information yet on these two detections, only what the uh, collaborations I have released in the GCN archive that these are these short uh, telegrams uh, to inform the community about the detection. So again, in both cases, um, these are long gamma ray bursts. In the S detected gamma ray bursts, the redshift is very small, 0.078. Um, the gamma ray burst is not particularly energetic, so we learn that it's not necessary to be very bright gamma ray burst um, in order to produce this TEV component. Um, but of course, if the gamma ray burst is not very energetic, it needs to be uh, nearby in order to detect uh, the emission. Um, 
The radiation was detected four to eight hours after the prompt, and the detection is significant and more than five sigma. This is all the information we have so far. For the magic gamma ray burst, what is particularly interesting is the redshift. So this time magic detected gamma ray, uh, this gamma ray burst at redshift 1.1, which is very, very large. So this is very promising also for future detection with CTA, because it means that we can really um, detect gamma ray bursts even when the red shield is quite large. And this is a summary of the properties of these four gamma ray bursts detected so far by sharing of telescopes. Um, so you see here distribution in, of uh, population of gamma ray bursts in the plane prompt energy. So this E gamma I, so is the energy emitted during the prompt versus the redshift. And so all the gamma reverse detected by Cherenkov telescopes are here, of course, because we need quite large energetics and redshift smaller than one. Uh, plus there is this subluminous uh, gamma reverse detected by S at very small redshift. Okay, so this gives an idea of how this small population of TV detected gamma ray bursts compared with the full uh, population, at least in this plane. Uh, I would like to conclude uh, mentioning a bit the prospect for CTA. So on the Cherenkov telescope array, we'll have three different um, telescopes, the LST, so large size telescopes that are sensitive in this low energy um, range. So in particular, they will um, be sensitive down to, sorry, down to 20, 30 GV, that is particularly the relevant for gamma ray bursts because at these energies, the emission is not attenuated by EPL, also at high redshift. And then we have the MSD medium-sized telescope that will be sensitive at higher energies. We do not expect to um, have useful information from the small size telescope that are sensitive above 10 TV where it's really, really difficult to measure emission from a gamma ray burst due to a strong EBL attenuation. But for sure, with the information that we have so far from this recent detection, we know that the LST and MST will play a very important role in um, increasing the number of uh, gamma ray bursts detected at these energies. Here, this is, there is a comparison with the sensitivity of MAGIC and S. So this plot gives a, an idea of uh, the fact that we will really change and improve our TV view of the uh, of gamma ray burst uh, with the CTA. Uh, there is an ongoing effort in the CTA <clears throat> collaboration to try to estimate the detection rate and also try to understand what is the gamma ray burst population that will be accessible with CTA and uh, um, so we are using population models for gamma ray bursts, so starting from an intrinsic uh, population that is consistent with what we see, what we detect at the thousand gamma ray bursts detected so far in the soft gamma ray range. And then we are modeling both prompt and afterglow radiation at very high energies based on uh, theoretical models. For the afterglow now, we also have observations that support the modeling. And then we will perform um, uh, simulations of the CTA, how CTA will respond to this um, uh, predicted TV uh, emission and its evolution in time. And uh, so a consortium paper is in preparation where we investigate quite in detail uh, how CTA will be able to detect prompt, hopefully, and after radiation from short and long gamma rebirths. There is also a study um, uh, that is investigating synergies with um, detecting interferometers for uh, gravitational wave detectors. And uh, um, 
also uh, synergies with next generation of uh, um, emissions for the study of gamma ray bursts like SVOM or TCUs. Um, so preliminary uh, results are very encouraging because we uh, are estimating from a few to several gamma ray bursts detected by CTA per year. So this will really change our um, understanding of the phenomenon and add information to the general picture. So to summarize why it's relevant to have GV TV observation for gamma ray burst studies. Well, uh, first of all, GV together with TV radiation reveal the clear presence of a additional component, probably inverse content. And um, we can better understand the nature of radiative processes. So the next step is try to detect TV radiation from the prompt emission of gamma ray bursts where we really don't know what is the um, nature of the, uh, of the um, prompt emission detected in thousands of gamma ray bursts. We still have no clue about the origin of this radiation. So to understand what's going on at TV energies might help to understand the nature of the uh, hard X-ray component. And then we saw how we can place constra constraints on the strength of the biomedical field by measuring the um, relative importance of synchrotron versus inverse Compton component. We can put a limit with GV observation to the maximum energy of the accelerated electron. In general, let me mention just to conclude that uh, these studies can be important also in other fields, and not only in gamma reverse physics, um, we can understand better physics of mild and ultra relativistic shocks or magnetic reconnection. And uh, this uh, observation have been already um, applied to study EBL studies. So gamma reverse can be complementary to other sources to um, constrain model for, uh, for the EBL, the extra galactic background light. And especially important is the recent detection of, ga of gamma ray bursts at TV energies at the redshift 1.1. So we can really extend uh, to relativity large redshift the study of EPL with, com with a complementary source and of course test for Lorentz invariance and violation. So I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lara. It was a very, very nice overview of, of GRBs. Um, is there any question already in the audience? You can just uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself and, and ask right away. I think Tom has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, just uh, two quick ones, if that's OK. The first was, um, unless I missed something, it looked like the, the TEV emission was often after the prompt. Is it, is it, is it, was that, is that correct that the emission seems to be the TV is part of the afterglow emission, or is that just something kind of observational? So, because the uh, field of view of the steering of telescopes is of a few degrees. So, they need an external alert. Um, so, from a side like Fermi or Swift that provides the exact location of the gamma bursts, and then the, the telescope will point the source. It needs time to move and point and place the gamma ray bursts within the field of view. Um, MAGIC is particularly suited for this because it can move and point the source in 30 seconds. Uh, depends, of course, on the initial position of the telescope and the final one, but um, there is also one case in which the, the camera reverse was pointed 24 seconds after the, the prompt emission. Um, so far, there is no evidence of um, TV emission during the prompt. Um, no evidence. There, there is no, in, 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 we never were able to start observation when the prompt emission was still ongoing. So we need a combination of particularly long gamma ray bursts, so maybe lasting hundreds of seconds, and uh, a very fast repointing. So, so far, it's only after glow radiation because um, 
no Chernobyl telescope was able to observe the gamma ray bursts already during the prompt. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, the other question I have was just: um, is there is there any kind of emission? Uh, kind of is there any known source of kind of precursor emission or anything before the prompt? Or is prompt really where you the first place you get the, the emission? Uh, no, but from TV energies, you mean, or in general? Um, I guess so, uh, high energy GV or TV. Would you expect to see um, anything before the initial burst? No. So sometimes uh, when you look at KV data and KV data, so hard um, X-rays, uh, you can see a precursor. What is called a precursor? sometimes even tens of seconds before the main event. Uh, but again, at TV energies, uh, it's difficult because um, the Cherenkov telescope is not observing the gamma ray bursts before. So you cannot look to previous data and see if you find uh, something. Uh, it's not expected. Um, this precursor that we see in hard X-rays, soft gamma rays, are um, another big puzzle of uh, gamma ray burst physics. Uh, so we really don't know what is going on there, but it's difficult to study the precursor at, at different wavelengths because usually in optical, in uh, all the other bands, you need to point the source. So you need first the alert from, from a gamma ray satellite. I see. Thanks very much. I think uh, Irene had a question first. Yeah, thanks for uh, this nice overview. I was wondering, um, when you were mentioning uh, about these uh, most recent uh, observations, you said that uh, to explain them, it would be nice to uh, have a temporal evolution of some of the unknown parameters, like it could be epsilon e and epsilon b. Uh, and I was wondering whether um, you can comment on the prospects of actually uh, learning how they evolve as a function of time because they are very uncertain now. So what are the prospects of improving this with the CTAS or other facilities? So um, this evolution of the parameters described in the shock were already uh, proposed before this uh, uh, very high energy observation because very often we are not able to explain X-ray, optical, and radio observations. There is always something that it's not uh, easy. So maybe we see a break in the optical that is due to the fact that a, a, a break of the synchrotron spectrum is crossing the optical band, but this is not consistent with what we see in the X-ray. So very often, the more after the simple afterglow model, where all these parameters are constant in time. Uh, um, fails in explaining the afterglow radiation. Now we have this additional uh, energy window that is showing, in, uh, this is my personal opinion, but it's showing that uh, uh, this um, model is limited. Uh, even though we have seven free parameters, we, uh, there is something that is not working. And uh, so, yes, one possibility is to start playing a bit with these parameters. So, of course, if you start to have more and more data at early time and you follow the evolution to late times, um, you can really start to see a trend maybe. So in old gamma reverse, you need to have uh, one of these parameters that evolve in time in a certain way. So you start to see, uh, you can start to see something uh, systematic in all gamma ray bursts. So this uh, can be a nice investigation to do uh, with more data. Of course, you need a well sampled light curve at different wavelengths, and this is quite rare. So you see for this gamma ray burst effect at my magic, a lot of beautiful data because magic announced immediately the detection and then all the facilities started observing the gamma ray burst. But usually for an average gamma ray burst, this is not the case. Okay, thank you. And uh, Luca has a question as well. Yes, uh, ciao Lara, very nice talk. Uh, just a question. Uh, ciao Luca. There are, there are students that uh, there are some evidence, at least in two of the GRBs that you have presented in your talk, 
that the local environment is quite dense and the evidence comes from the high extinction found along the line of sight. Uh, if I understand correctly, this TV component is mostly associated with the afterglow of the GRB, then with the, the external shock uh, emission. So I would like to know if you have an idea if the fact that the environment is very dense has some influence on the origin of the, this TV emission. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> I know that there is this evidence, so we still have few gamma ray bursts detected at TV energies, but um, there is this unusual, unusually large extinction that you see in the optical data, but also the NH from the X-ray. So, um, yeah, I think it's quite interesting. It's not immediate to understand why um, there should be a connection between this large extinction and TV radiation. The first guess is uh, to have a large density, but um, I, I don't know. I still have to think about it. I, I think that a lot of people is starting to um, point out this uh, strange uh, connection. Uh, so maybe by investigating more uh, the relation between the density of the medium and the TV radiation, uh, it would be possible to connect uh, the, the two. Okay. okay, thank you very much. All right. I, I have one question, if I may. Uh, so you're showing that the, that the simple synchrotron, electron synchrotron model sometimes doesn't fit data quite well, and, that, and you go to SSC and alternatives. Um, my question is, uh, is, is the uh, statement that the simple synchrotron model doesn't fit the data based on the fact that you have a simple one zone uh, model where emission and acceleration happen in the first, in the same place in the, in the production region, or is this independent of the one zone or multiple zone assumption? Um, no, of course, uh, one, um... So, so it's very simple, this model. So yes, one complication that you can add is the devolution of the parameters. Another one is to start to um, uh, diversify the region where particles accelerate, are accelerated to, with the region where the uh, magnetic field, where the um, particles cool, effectively cool. So for example, when I show that this epsilon B, that is a parameter that gives an idea of the amplification of the magnetic field, and when I show the plot showing that epsilon B must be quite small, it's unclear what is this uh, um, epsilon B. I mean, it's the amplification just um, downstream of the shock or it's a region where the particle cools more effectively. So um, epsilon B should be large in order to explain how we can accelerate particles at large energy. We need um, perturbation in the magnetic field. Uh, we need a strong amplification of the magnetic field. And, uh, but then um, the question is where the particles really emit most of and lose most of their energy. So do they feel this large magnetic field or the magnetic field decays downstream and the uh, region that we need to invoke for the, um, uh, for the cooling of the particles is a region where the magnetic field is already smaller. There are simulation, particle in cell simulation that are trying to address these issues. So understand what is the structure of the magnetic field uh, behind the, the, the shock, so downstream. So yes, you can add several levels of, of um, complication. Okay, thank you. I don't see any more raised hands, so... Uh... Thank uh, uh, Lara again. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, and as uh, usual, we'll meet in a couple of weeks for our next seminar. Thank you very much, Lara. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.